time. <laughs> so it's good to see you today. You too. It's good to see everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. I see uh, GW from Minnesota and Shannon from Canada. Shannon, where are you from? Canada? Where, where within Canada are you? And then Javier is here and uh, Juan Villanueva. Did you see him at Typecom? I, saw I him. didn't see him. No, but I'm, yeah, no. We follow each other on Instagram, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, some there. Oh, thank you. from Saskatchewan, that's awesome. Um, and then Jess, of course, is here, so that's great. Hi, Jess. And then Anne, Anne was a little mad that uh, that she didn't know about this. She just found out about a couple, couple Sorry, hours ago. Sorry, yeah, I read text earlier. Thanks for joining. <laughs> exactly. So I was thinking we should say um, that, oh, let's don't tell Aaron about this. Everyone else will invite except Aaron. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> um, so it's good to see everyone. And Rochelle's here. Awesome. I'm glad that you are joining us today. We have Ifa Mooney here. She is from the Kent State University. Uh, we're going to get started in just a second. Hey, Aaron. <laughs> We're going to get started here in just a second. Uh, feel free to uh, copy the URL and share it out. Tell everyone that we are just getting started. Also, feel free to let us know where you, where you are tuning in from in the chat bar. Um, and also, if you're an educator. So this week we have been, uh, this week, this summer we have been focusing on educators and finding out how uh, educators help their students bridge the gap from education to the professional practice. If you have any questions along the way that, that require more explanation, please use the Ask a Question tab underneath our video, and uh, we will answer them in order. Hi, Eric. It's good to see you. It's good mm -hmm. to see you. Great. Uh, so yeah, let us know if you're an educator and uh, where you're teaching. It's lovely to get everyone together and talk about design especially while you guys are working on your syllabi right now. So I know that everyone's scrambling in the next two weeks. You're probably going back to class or at least preparing to go so. Um, oh, excellent. Yay, I see yeah, that. So, yeah. <laughs> That's <Good>. wonderful. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> excellent. All right, so we're going to get started again. So I am Rachel, and I'm producer here at Type Ed in Los Angeles. And I'm here with Ifa Mooney all the way from Kent State University. That means in you're in Ohio, is that correct? That's right, yep. Yeah, you, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, so um, I'm actually originally from Dublin in Ireland and uh, made my way to Ohio with a few stops on the way. So I studied graphic design in Ireland and worked as a graphic designer for a few years. And then I went back to school to study uh, typeface design in Reading. Uh, University of Reading and then I moved to New York with Erin uh, to work at Heffler and Fair Jones Type Foundry and then I moved to Ohio about now nearly five years ago with my uh, partner and I started working as a tenure track professor out here um, and I work on uh, typeface design as part of my research and typography. Very interesting. So you span both the professional practice and education. And, and do you feel like, like, what do you feel like that you bring to your students with that type of background? Um, so I think type design was a kind of way for me to uh, look at other parts of design. So it's sort of a microcosmic example of the sort of iterative process that we have in other kinds of design. And been in both uh, visual and language and so typography is a way to connect both of those but really um, my interest in typeface design is just uh, symptomatic of a larger interest in language and graphics so I guess that's kind of what I focus on more generally for the students benefit. Very unique. Right. And I love that you have your MA from Reading. That's a great school. I wouldn't know. I haven't been there, but I've heard some great things about oh, it's great. the program there. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank so you. shall we get started? Sure. Okay. Okay. So do you want me to talk through my little slides? That yeah. Ready? Let's go okay. and share your slides. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. And um, meanwhile, while you're doing that, I noticed that Javier is from Brooklyn and he's an educator from the University of New Haven. And Lucas, hey Lucas, how are you doing from Germany? And then Jamie from LCAD in Southern California, where Michael teaches as well. And Rochelle's here from Chapman. Excellent. All right. So you guys can see that, I hope now, right? Yes, yes. 
Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, Rachel just asked me to, you, you asked me to prepare a kind of overview of typography at Kent State. So here it goes. Um, Hold on, wait, 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 sorry. Oh yeah. So, so it just disappeared. I think you tried oh. to uh, present the whole screen. So just do from, that's okay. Okay, is there that you better? Yeah. You got me? Yeah. Okay, um, let me. And if not, you can just share your whole screen and then. It means your... That works. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so yeah, this is um, where we're based. So a lot of people that I say I work in Kent State and their first um, port of call for memory recollection is the Kent State shootings on May 4th when um, the National Guard opened fire on some student protesters who were protesting against the Vietnam uh, war and we actually live in that building that's where the school of visual communication design is um as of last year so this is our brand new space um on the left hand side you can see lots of floor to ceiling windows lots of natural light which is awesome and uh on the right hand side there you'll see we also have a brand new um gallery because of this new space and we had our first uh, kind of inaugural exhibition of the work of paul sayer who is actually an alum of Kent State last year. Um, this is our wonderful gallery director on the left organizing a student show in this space. So it's quite a large space, which is awesome. We do um, try to connect with uh, typographic educators across the world. So this is Jamie Murphy in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin, um, showing our students some of the letterpress facilities that they have there. Um, that was a study abroad trip a couple of years ago. Um, but we have, uh, our typography curriculum really starts with intro to typography and for a long time that was the only official type class that our students got because the rest of their typographic education was threaded through uh, their graphic design um, classes. Um, and in that class it's a fairly sort of traditional approach to the starting points of typography. We build some posters where we look at just hierarchy and um, what to do in a small space and then we move out to um, systems thinking where we make a set of spreads and a poster that match and then we make a book um, so we're looking at kind of building from the word to the paragraph to so the uh, sequential narrative and then that gets picked up in places like graphic design too where we can see here this is a book cover the typographic focus is the kind of starting point for the whole concept um, where the book wraps around with type and is literally surrounding the content um, and then here is another example of, uh, this is an identity system built using a specific typeface as a starting point um, and then building that out into patterns and shapes. So typography is kind of the underpinning uh, ideology of most of these classes. This is another one from GD2, um, looking at creating a visual language from typography also and letting the typography communicate an idea of community. Um, and then, so that's that's kind of uh, pre the two main classes that I teach, which are uh, type design and advanced type. And the type design class um, was new from when I arrived. Um, and I did a good bit of research on syllabi, like connecting with other type designers who teach, like Cyrus Highsmith and James Montalbano, who were very, very generous with their um, help and information on what they do in their classes. So from all of that information, I built a syllabus that was intended to kind of um, move students from what they already knew about uh, graphic design um, in identity design, systems thinking, uh, the creation of uh, personality through uh, form and then allow them to take those skills and um, kind of run with them in a different uh, piece of software. So we use glyphs and the, we start off by building one of the more complicated letters so that they're thrown into the deep end and they have to learn how to use the Bezier tool really well. Um, and I love how experimental they get, like this little dog guy, sausage dog ampersand. And then from there, we also do that because it's a fusion of two letter forms. So they're thinking about harmony of two letters, E and T combining, things like that. Um, and then they build a logo type. So having learned how to use glyphs and be excellent pro drawers in glyphs, they move into a logo type. And then from the logo type, they derive um, characteristics that they might either, either pull into a typeface that accompanies or uh, extends or supports that logo type. Um, this is an example of one of those logo types. Um, they have to show it in situ and they have to reflect on what the meaningful decisions that they've made are to create personality in the forums. 
This is another one um, for um, the previous one was by Grant Wong and this one is by Gracie Harms. Um, and this was for a participatory art gallery. So the idea is that the letter forms would shift and change and that you could kind of showcase the idea that um, the audience for this art is playing with it. Um, this is another example of, uh, this is a grad student who found some really esoteric Gothic uh, manuscript form and decided he would build a modern typeface out of that and then turn it into for the local area. Uh, this is an experimental, project that happened in an independent study last year by Dean Sweetnich, um, looking at uh, how you can make something out of a repeating module that doesn't feel kind of mechanical and repetitive. Um, this was playing with variable fonts. This is Natalie Snodgrass's work, a grad student here at Kent State, um, and she wanted to see how she could make a typeface that really played with this idea of the functionality of variability. So this is her typeface function. This is another one, I love this one. Uh, this was, I, the idea behind this was to make an identity system. This is Jason Medrano's work. Uh, an identity system with using just a typeface for a group that comes together to talk about graphic design. And so you can see in the little detail here that a lot of the shapes are informed by the shapes of speech bubbles. Um, this was a typeface called Toddler Pro, designed for people who use code a lot, um, but are also playful. Uh, this is another one called Galandrina Old Style. It's a display typeface um, using uh, historical forms for a modern context. And then um, the other type or the other type class that I teach on is called Advanced Type, um, and the syllabus for that class um, moves its way through. Um, designing for print, uh, for a poster, but it's expressive typography in this context. And they make two posters, then they make one of them move. So they're looking at how movement can change the meaning or um, kind of enhance the typographic detailing. And then we move into um, more guided learning um, where we'd set the outcomes, but they have to come up with all of the content and meaningful um, decisions themselves and then lastly they do the international society of typographic designers briefs and um, i'll talk a little bit more about that in a second so um the first posters as you can see here very, are very different from the intro to typography ones these are much more experimental and as uh, student content generated um and then we had a this was from two years ago i think we have an exhibition of that work so you can see the projection here of one of the moving versions of that static poster that I just showed you by Leslie Theater. This is the middle project. This is designing an identity system using just typographic forms. So this was using the idea that letter forms are symbols and making repeating patterns out of them. Um, this is another project from that class uh, looking at this told the story of the radium girl, early 20th century, who painted radium on the uh, hands of clocks and watches and um, the green is for the radium of the color of radium and then the holes are to show the increasing um, degradation of the bones of these poor unfortunate women who were painting radium on watch faces so it's just kind of to show you the idea that the students think about the content as well as the form um, and production when they're going through these projects so this all leads to the last project which is um, where we use the briefs from the International Society of Typographic Designers. Um, and so this uh, society is much more well known outside of the US. Um, and I actually did one of the briefs when I was in school and I loved it. So when I started in Kent, I really wanted to see if we could make it happen over here. Um, so for the first couple of years of being here, we sent student work over to the main assessment in the UK. But then uh, two years ago, myself and my colleague, Gillian Khoury, set it up over here. So we hosted the very first ISCD assessment here um, and we've done two now and so we're trying to get more and more educators to be involved and um, this is kind of how it works we have educators and professionals from all over the US come to assess the work in teams and um, this is from 2017 so um, Paul from Eden Speakerman here um, the head of the ISCD education board um, and Alan Haley um, from Monotype, previously from Monotype and um, Here's the head of the Irish um, assessment. Um, 
and you can just see people working together here, assessing the work. And this is the pro these are some of the projects that come out of those briefs, um, which are really open-ended and ask the student to really think about what they're interested in. So this is a project on the idea of McCarthyism. And so it's really fusing um, typography as hierarchical organizational system and typography as expressive um, way of treating content. So this was the cover. So the idea is that this is a six part book series and you tear it open because um, McCarthyism and the, the book is called Anxiety, um, The Age of Anxiety from McCarthyism to Terrorism. And the idea is that you're slowly finding more and more difficult to access information. So these sewn wow. edges are, yeah, get more and more complicated to get into the content. Um, and then this is another one, um, reinvestigating the new typography um, in a modern context for the digital uh, era. So the book is not actually bound, it behaves like a series of pixels and you um, can take it apart and put it back together. And then on the back of all of these pixels um, is uh, the student's own manifesto, uh, which kind of, contrasts and challenges the new typography in the first instance and then you can see also that there are these little kind of flip up pieces that are supposed to evoke um, typography on screen and then this is uh, the last thing I'm going to show you which is um, one of the commendations that came out of the ISTD um, so one of the top tier results um, and it is an interpretation of the poem We Real Cool and it allows you to actually interact with the content in a way that builds in a generative fashion. So there's no actual final structure for the poem. It just kind of takes shape according to the user interaction. That's really interesting. So yeah, that's basically all I have to tell you. <laughs> so open to Thank questions. You. Yeah. Can you can you keep that open a second? I have a few oh, questions. Yeah. And if you guys sure. have any questions, please put them underneath the Ask a Question tab and we'll go through them. So that was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing all of that. Could you go back to the introduction uh, slides? Yeah, of course. The intro to type, yeah. So the intro to type, is that that's not a, that's a type design class, correct? The intro to type, Typography is intro to typography, and then it's very confusing. I need to Got diss it. the intro part, okay. but yeah, there's typography and type design. Yeah, which one did you I want? See. To okay, start? so this one is fine. So I find that these projects and the type design ones are quite advanced. I mean, they're they're gorgeous from the students. Um, where do they take them? Are they taking them in their freshman year? Are they taking them in junior year? Like, uh, what are the prereqs for them to get into these classes? Right. Okay. So this is actually um, third semester. So uh, intro to typography is their very first. Um, I think they take one class before that. That's uh, VCD Studio. It's like the fundamentals of form and layout. Um, but this is the first place that they really start to use different typefaces and think about what the choice of typeface means and how you put them together. So yeah, this is pretty early on in their trajectory. Intro to type design and advanced typography are both upper level electives. So they can choose to take those after they've taken graphic design one and two. I see. Okay. So the type design, they already have a typography background. They do. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Got it. Um, and then also the motion work, how are they, how do they know how to animate? Do they learn that in another class or do you teach that in your class? We do like a demo, but we don't actually teach any technology in the classroom here at Kent. We use Linda. We have a full um, registration for all the students for Linda. And so we will assign different tutorials. And then obviously as needed in class, we'll demo specific kinds of functionality that they might need for the different programs. Like if we're doing an information design project, we will show them in Illustrator how to take content from a graph and bring, or from a spreadsheet and bring it into a graph and things like that. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, kind of open-ended. And even with the animated um, version of the posters, we leave that open to them how they want to tackle it because like, I'm really totally fine if they want to do stop motion or if they want to do an animated GIF or if they want to take it into After Effects, it's really up to them according to what it is they're trying to achieve. So we really try to let the um, designers um, intention lead how they're approaching the solution, I guess. Okay, great. Can you go to the, the type design slides? Thank you. Sure. And thank you to everyone who jumped in here while we were doing our talk. So um, Maria G, uh, two of two Mar Marinas, one Marina and one Maria, and then Mike, it's good to see you. And Victoria, thank you for coming. Um, so the type design, so you start with an ampersand. Mm -hmm. And is that just to 
get them used to the glyph software or just because they are already familiar with the uh, glyph? What so it's a kind of, it has a bit of a, yeah, it's a good question because it is one of the hardest things to make. Yeah. So they kind of look at me like, what is wrong with you? Um, <laughs> but it's because it allows me to kind of fast forward them through a lot of different teaching or learning objectives. So it has an S curve. So it has a point of inflection in the curve. So um, that is one of the most difficult things to master when you're drawing a letter form because you have two parallel paths and they need to feel parallel, but they can't actually be parallel because if they are completely parallel, a lot of the time the speed of the inner and outer curve looks different. And this is something that's better just learned by doing. So that's why I throw them in at the deep end. Um, it also, because it's one letter form, made out of two letter forms, they have to think about how did it evolve and look back through the history of typography to see how that shape has been treated in different scripts. The other idea is to get them thinking about how different mark making tools change the way that the contrast model will behave in the shape. So I have them, because it's only one letter again, or one combination of letters, they can use any mark making materials and go through a whole array of different shapes for this ampersand. And then that allows them to explore how personality can be conveyed through different um, kinds of approaches to the letter form structure. So we look at like broad nib pens, um, the pointed nib pen, just using mark making tools, like even cutting and tearing paper to see what that does, if they want to suggest like depth and things like that in the letter form. And then also just playing with figurative stuff. So a lot of the time students who have a really strong background in illustration and not very good chops when it comes to typography take the class to see if they can improve their typographic understanding and actually a lot of the time surprisingly the students who have the worst typographic skills in that like to organize content is difficult for them come out with the best skills in drawing letter forms because it's a different way of thinking it's more about systematic shape making than it is about um, designing a layout so composition can be weak in their background but when they apply it to one single letter form they get better um mm. and i think that's all i have to say about the upper <laughs> so, so you're so you're going from one glyph and then the logo type is a system across many letters mm -hmm. right yeah. depending and do you assign them the exact name of the brand that they're so no, I tell them what useful letters are. So we, we I kind of front loaded and say, we're going to work on letters, lowercase letters, A-D-E-O-I-N, which is a sort of truncated version of adhesion, which is what we use in Reading. Um, and those letters are, you could have a whole conversation about why they're useful, but they're very useful to defining the DNA of a lowercase alphabet. Um, and the uppercase letters tend to have less variation in their form. They fall more categorically into like a square, a rectangle, or a square, circle, and triangle. But the lowercase vary a lot. So we start with lowercase. So I tell them like if you can come up with a word that gives you um, the behavior for some of those five letters, then you'll make your life a little easier. But it's really up to you. So like I've had students make things that are just three letters long and some that are you know, super califragilistic, whatever. Um, but the idea is that um, I am going to guide them on the complexity of it. So if it's very complex, we might go for fewer letters. If it's very simple in terms of its execution, we might go for more just because it'll give them more um, useful information. But the other thing about the logo type is that they're not actually stuck with whatever they come up with it. They always get concerned and think like, is this going to be what I work on for the rest of the semester? Um, but they, uh, they make the letters and then I've had many students throw them away and take just abstract cues from them. So they might have made something that feels really sushi and kind of brush like. And they realize, I want to make a sans serif typeface. Like, obviously, I need to ditch some of these characteristics, but they'll take one or two little pieces. So it might be just the way that the connections form or the terminal shapes and pull them into a sans serif uh, workhorse typeface. So they're really just to, it's just to get them thinking about how do you make a set of letter forms work together, spacing, harmony of each individual form, and the relationship between the parts? I see. And then the third project is the full alphabet, correct? Yeah. That's when they, yeah. okay. Sorry, go ahead. So, that's okay. Is there, is there a connection between the logo type and the prototype and specimens, or no? They're completely three there different projects. There can be. So um, they are technically uh, 
the prototype and specimen are obviously related. The specimen is a way to, for them to show off their typeface. Um, and that's dependent on what kind of typeface they make and what the purpose of it was. So like for the Toddler Pro that I showed you, that was actually a website that was developed because it was for coding and use on screen. There didn't make sense that it would be a paper specimen in the end. Um, but yeah, the logo type is um, really focused on the idea of making a system of shapes that conveys personality. So I actually encourage them to go as far as they can with personality in the shapes and making them as expressive as possible, even if it means that they later have no idea how to approach approach the extended, like a, a typeface that would accompany that, just because it means that they learn more about the limits of legibility, and then they can apply that learning to a more systematic typeface. So the typeface doesn't have to be completely related to the logo type, but it's always informed by it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, that does. And and they are developing the whole typeface in glyphs. Yes. So it's usable. Yeah. How did you, how did you, that's, that's, that's the projects, well, at least two of them are. Yeah, well. so the, the ampersand is only about uh, two weeks long. The logotype, I think, is two weeks as well. And then the prototype and specimen takes the rest of the semester. Um, so we, uh, I don't know, we just kind of, <laughs> it works. That's, it works. They, they get really excited, like shockingly. You know, they, there's always one or two people at the start who are like, oh, God, am I in the wrong class? I had no idea what I was, you know, getting into. Um, but it's strange. Like, there's something... There's something in type design that is so mesmeric and relaxing if you enjoy it, that it actually becomes, I had students like where this is taking over their lives and I have other professors giving out to me because like I'm taking time away <laughs> from their classwork because it's just like, it's like a happy place to go to and they don't have to think about, because they can't think about what it looks like really uh, as a finished printed designed piece because that's not how type works until it's produce they have to just really think about like the shapes themselves which is a kind of leveler so they they actually move through through it pretty quickly great okay so i'm gonna close your slides okay. and then bring you back and then we have some questions okay all right so the first question is from marina gonzalez hello marina uh, hello. she asked is preparing projects for print production part of what is covered in your programs Prepa preparation such as turning type to outlines, flattening booklets, bleeds, etc. Yes, we have a design for production class. I don't teach it, so I'm not completely sure what's covered in it, but we do have, that would be a final year class, or actually junior year, um, where they look at, um, yeah, all of the, all, everything that goes into preparing it for print. Yeah, but we don't focus too much on that in class because we're trying to get them to think about the ideas, yeah. Right. It's great that you have that as part of the curriculum because there's a lot of colleges that are pulling that class yeah. out. It's yeah. Unfortunate. yeah. I think it's important to keep it in. Yeah. I think so too. I think so. People, print is not dead. <laughs> so. no. And then Jamie is asking, did you say that you use the Glyphs app for this class? Yes. 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 Very big fan of Glyphs. Yep. So are you trans, uh, are you using Illustrator at all in order to get them to understand the Beziers and the vectors? Or are you just jumping right into glyphs? Um, we, we jump right into glyphs. Um, <laughs> I, I do let them sometimes let them, but like if they are really, really uncomfortable, they will typically start in Illustrator. And then as soon as they have to bring it into glyphs, they start realizing the issues with that because just the curve control is so much stronger in glyphs. And the nuance of what you can achieve is so much better in glyphs that, and, and that's not to denigrate Illustrator at all. Like, you know, we will use them in tandem. And sometimes in some of the lettering projects, like for the logo type, they might work in glyphs, bring it into Illustrator, look what it looks like, see quickly what it looks like with a drop shadow or a bevel, or bring it back into glyphs, you know? So I'm totally fine with them using both, but I don't use Illustrator as a way to kind of explain glyphs because they do behave a little differently. Okay, great. I hope that answers your question, Jamie. Okay, so if you guys have any other questions, let me know. Uh, just pop into the ask a question tab. I have a list for you. Hello. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So I, I uh, have brought this up to you before, but um, if you know how type is taught, at least on your end, differently than other schools. Oh, um... or, or is it very similar to how you've learned it or different 
than how you've learned it? Um, well, my pathway through type has been kind of uh, like, I feel like by looking at type design, that's, I suppose that's the one thing. Like, I think by bringing type design into our curriculum, we have a slightly different way of looking at typography. That wasn't um, like the classes were developed independently but what we've noticed especially between advanced type and type design is that if students take type design first they come in and they kind of want to make more letters as the basis of their uh, content for um, books or websites and things like that so they feel more confident with understanding how the shapes work and then vice versa if they have taken advanced type because it requires them to do kind of micro grain typesetting they have a better understanding of what open type features can do for them and then when they're in type design they want to play with those ideas um, so I suppose that's the one difference which also is informed by the way that I learned. I'm sure that there's a lot of overlap between what we do in other classes and other schools because we do have a solid um, Swiss type background in the school and we used to have a summer school in Basel here at Kent. Um, but I think what myself and my colleague Gillian are, tr are trying to do is bring in a little bit more experimental typography, so sort of like I guess I think about uh, typography for page layout and um, more traditional typography as like the prose of typography and then mm -hmm. the experimental is like the poetry. So we're trying to do a little bit more of the poetry. So I guess that would be something different if you didn't have a type design or advanced type curriculum at your school. I think the type design is pretty unique. There's not a lot of schools that teach type design. So I'm sure that your background, not only in Reading, but also working at Hafler brings in a lot more informed um, instruction. And so is that something that the other teachers teach as well? Or are you the only one teaching type? No, of? it's just it's just me. And I do pull in like Erin uh, was one of our visiting lecturers there a year ago, um, a couple of years ago now, I don't know. Um, and I have had people visit by Skype as well in the past for the class. But yeah, it's just me here at the moment. Yeah. OK, great. Another question. So from Rochelle. She's saying, do you teach cultural typography perspectives and design? In one of my classes, I have about 10 countries represented. Typographic taste and approaches vary greatly. Though there are many universal typography principles, do you see the limits of only teaching typography from a Western perspective? Absolutely. Um, so we don't have a class that's specifically dedicated to typography and its cultural context. But we could, I think most class, like, yeah, I fully agree. It's a great question. Um, I think um, I think we should have more conversation about that. Um, I have an under or a MFA student, she's my thesis supervisee at the moment, working on the relationship between type design and non-Latin design. It's a problematic term in itself. But I think um, that, I really believe that should be wrapped into every conversation about typography, especially when we have globalization and the kind of um, design projects that they work on might be like annual reports and then thinking that that often now is going to be including multiple scripts like that's something that definitely needs to be uh, handled with care and um, sensitively and I, I, I could see a logic behind just making a fully dedicated typography and its cultural context class yeah and also typography in its relationship to language, because even just the way that punctuation is used across the globe is not quite the same. So I think um, that's a great question. And and maybe now I'll propose a class. So thank you. <laughs> oh, it's definitely needed in class. It's also not only needed in education, but also in the professional, professional world. I mean, we are confronted all the time with translating our information or our projects into other languages. And so definitely we should be aware of the use and um, also helps our design decisions when we know that it's going to be read in other languages. Absolutely. Great, thank you so much, Rochelle. I hope that answers your question. So Juan is asking, how large are your classes? How many hours a week do you meet? Have you found a good magic number, good balance of both? That's a great question. And I came against it this uh, semester because, um, so we've now made two type design classes per year. We used to have to just one. And uh, this last semester, demand got a little too high and I was a little too soft and I ended up with 25 people in my class and wow. that was too many, uh, officially too many. So um, I think a sweet spot is around 12 to 15 students for a type design class for 15 weeks to cover what we're trying to cover. Um, we meet uh, twice a week for two hours, 45 minutes. Um, 
And I can't remember what the other question was. Uh, how many, okay, how many hours a week do you meet and have you found a good magic number balance for both? Yeah, um, I would say 12 to 15 is probably um, good. I also, I teach on the crafting type workshops. I don't know if you have uh, come across them before, but um, they've kind of had a little bit of hiatus lately because we're totally just, you know, independent whether or not we can make it or not. But mm -hmm. whenever we've run those workshops in the past, we have aimed for a ratio of 10 students per instructor. So whenever we get more demand, we add another instructor. So I think that's generally a pretty comfortable number for that amount of hours a week. Got it. Okay. One, I hope that helps. Yeah. So uh, do you also do any um, uh, specialized or independent studies or any, do you work with any grad students? Um, are they interested in type design as well? Yeah, very. Um, so actually I've had one comment that I've had repeatedly in SSIs is a student surveys and instruction is that the type design class could happen earlier in the program, which I was really surprised by because I had the same instinct as you do, which is like, you know, surely they would have to have a very strong understanding of typography before they start making letter forms. But actually, um, I think that what happens for a lot of the students who take it in their like last or second to last final semester is that um, they realized that if they had just known how letters were made and made to work together with the intention of the typographer's needs as the outcome, they would have done better with actually applying the logic of a typeface and, and learned how to explore it and use it properly. Um, I've lost my point. Where was I going with that? What did you ask me? <laughs> we're talking about, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I can't remember what I was answering there. We have another question, but I do have a question off of that. So um, you're talking about understanding how to make letters before they get into advanced typography, correct? Um, yeah. Do you have any letterpress classes or anything that's like, you know, the students using their hands before they move to the digital space? Yeah, so we have mm -hmm. uh, we have type high press here. We have um, letterpress print. Uh, we have a letterpress print shop um, and they can take that class. It's an upper level elective also um, in their junior or senior year. So a lot of the time I end up with students who are taking letterpress at the same time as doing type design, um, which I would actually say it's better to have them do it beforehand um, yes. because again, it slows them down. Um, but often they're doing it together and they like that kind of contrast between the digital and the manual. Okay, great. And are you also teaching any brush lettering or any handmade lettering? Um, so I've developed a syllabus intro to lettering um, and I've been trying to get it into the curriculum, but it hasn't happened yet. So what I've been doing instead, oh, you asked me, that was the previous question. You asked me if I ever did independent studies. And so this is how I've done that. I've been okay. running that, that syllabus with uh, independent investigations because students will take the type design class because they really like lettering and they're very good at it and they think they'll get to do that in the class and they do a little bit of it for the logo type but really it's typeface design so then after they've taken the class they're more confident in typography and they're like can I do more can we do just lettering so I made this syllabus that builds from um, like an individual word to multiple words to an editorial layout context for um, integrating the lettering into a typographic context um, so yes, the students tend to kind of, once they figure out what typography or what type design works like, they want more of just like what letters mean, how they can be laden with personality, all that kind of stuff. Okay, great. So Juan is asking, how do you handle critiques in the classroom for both typography and type design? Okay, um, so it's a good question because they are quite different, at least in my experience. Um, for type design, the first month is essentially teaching them how to discuss um, because the it's not so much that they don't know. And I mean, I think most type designers will concur that most people actually have a very good eye for shapes and can read what's wrong with something very quickly. Um, but they don't know what it is that they're seeing. So they're very nervous about saying it. So that's been my experience in teaching type design, because a lot of the time, the students are just standing there quiet, like terrified they're going to say the, the wrong thing. And as soon as I say it, they're like, oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking, you know. So <laughs> that's been 
that the the hardest part is really just like giving them some confidence that they have the answers in their head and that they are seeing the right things and that their their um judgments about things are correct or at least make sense and are helpful to other people um the other thing that is different about type design and typography is just the impact of scale which is not something that i mean it does impact looking at typographic layouts but not to the same extent because when you're designing letter forms on screen you're looking at them as this huge size and then they get compacted into a paragraph and then they get even smaller and so a lot of the time and i'm sure most people who taught type design uh, to any degree will concur again on this, that um, the student will try and put as much personality in each every in each and every letter as they can. And then when they put them together, it's just a Frankenstein of a word. Um, so, so that's something that's really different, like getting them to photocopy and um, reduce the size of the letters that they're looking at, stand back from them. And all of this I totally just learned from my wonderful teachers in Reading. Uh, particularly Jerry Linus. Um, so the other than typography, I guess, is more um, like looking at it from different levels. So um, like the overall read, uh, standing back from it, like how does our eye move across the composition, then looking into the nitty gritty, like is the typographic treatment and hierarchical setting actually telling us anything significant about the semantics of the paragraph and the intention of the author? Like, is it being are the right things being highlighted, that kind of stuff. So um, I guess, yeah, it's like, I would start with the meaning of the words and then move ever further away from it to check that it's that the macro read and the micro read have a relationship with each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, the students do take intro to typography before they take type design, correct? Yes, yes. But does, does it make sense for them to switch that, to take type design before typography? Because well, the way you- Oh, sorry, okay. the way I- the, the way you describe the critiques is like they are looking at it as a whole and then but they still need to understand the the shapes of the letter forms right so it almost makes sense to understand the letter forms first and then figure out how they work together I don't yeah know. no no i agree and actually that's been the feedback that i've gotten from a lot of students that they should take it before or at the same time as their typography classes. Um, that's not the way that it's run here, just because of the way that the curriculum is set right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I could see that being uh, a logical way to approach it. I just think there, there would probably be a difference in the syllabus for intro to type design for students who've never taken a typography class and intro to type design for students who have, because right. just even like the fact that you're building a typeface as a system and a product and a tool, the product and the tool part are very important um, and you can't make a good typeface product or tool without understanding how it will be used and so you know there would need to be a different um focus yeah so you need both of them as yeah always yeah at the yeah. same time even one i hope that helped thank you so much for the question so aline is asking could you tell us more about your time at reading in general and from an educational perspective okay um my time at Reading was a breakneck pace of a year. Um, it uh, was wonderful. It was a very eye-opening experience. I was actually choosing between doing type design or uh, design and culture. So I was sort of like on the fence about the meaning of typography versus the making of type. Um, and I'm really glad that I went with the making of type in Reading specifically because actually I ended up looking at all of the meaning and the cultural context anyway, because that's the focus of Reading's uh, curriculum is that you look at the cultural context and the uh, kind of semiotic value of the letters as much as um, just making pretty things that work well and can be good for selling stuff. Um, I guess uh, I had a wonderful crew of um, teammates, classmates at the time. Um, Aaron uh, obviously is one of my favorite humans and we started in Reading together, sat beside each other, went to New York together, lived together and worked together. And so uh, it was very life-changing in that regard. I've always, um, whenever anybody's asked me, like I've gotten a few emails from other typographers from Ireland wondering, should they go to Reading? And I've always been very careful to note that it is very intense. And so it was, um, you know, it, it was, difficult it was a difficult year because it was so um breakneck and you're in 
the middle of nowhere in England. Like it's very pretty. Reading is a very pretty town, but it's a small town. Like and uh, it's the kind of place where like plums and fruit grow on trees and people leave out bags for you to take them home. Like it's so lovely and idyllic, but there's really nothing else to do except for work on your typeface and drive yourself kind of crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> then that's a perfect place for it. Yeah, exactly. So what is your background then before you got into Reading? Like what is what helped you inform your getting your um, MA from Reading? So I worked as a graphic designer um, in Dublin and mostly worked on identity systems and logo types and, and book design. Um, but I so I started out working with uh, actually a very my very first job was working on ads in public in a publications design um, company um, and they had all of these different publications and uh, they were so in Ireland the police are called the Gardaí so there was Garda Times which is a free publication for the Gardaí in Ireland and Fire Call which was another publication for firemen or and women. Um, and so they, uh, my job was to design the ads that were placed in these uh, these magazines. Um, but the people who were placing the ads had been strong armed into placing the ads in order to fund the magazine's publication in the first place. So, and we had no money and we had no visuals. So it was all typography is where I'm going with this. So it got me really interested in how typography can create a visual language where there isn't anything and you're basically starting from scratch. And then after that, I worked in a firm and I worked mostly on their pitch projects for new clients for identity design and logo types. So I made a lot of logo types for that. And I think I just realized in that process that I really loved making letters and the systematic nature of identity design. And then I quit that job and I worked as an independent uh, freelancer for maybe four or five years. And most of that work was for not for profits. And again, just saw the value of typography as a very cheap tool for making identity systems and graphics. Um, and then I just was sitting on my own all the time, working at home, kind of going out of my mind. And I was like, okay, either I go back to a studio or I go back to school. And I decided to go back to school. So, Got it. Okay. So Jess, we weren't, we, I promise we were not trying to ignore you. We we're just in the middle of another question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so Jess is asking any advice for others in teaching positions as how to, how, as how to, you can encourage the least confident students and how to engage the students who may feel more defensive about critique? This okay. is like a lifetime question, right? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, to encourage the least confident students. Um, so honestly, type design, that's easier um, because they have no, nobody has any idea what they're doing. And they're really sort of star students that everybody knows are really good at typography they come in ready to be excellent at this thing and often are not and then all of a sudden you see the surge of the students who have never been good at typography who actually know what they're talking about and they feel so good about it um then i suppose i uh, it, it comes i really do think stuff like that comes down to the individual instructor's personality too I'm very soft, so I'm like I kind of make it all a conversation. I don't do an awful lot of lecturing. It's almost all smaller group critiques or one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I'll just usually try and find something that I know about this student. And also, like a lot of the time, they're in the class and I've taught them before. So find something that I know they're interested in and use that as their kind of tool. You know, like you're you've always been really good at drawing these kinds of things. Maybe you want to pull that in. Like here's your opportunity to take your interest in like wiener dogs, had that student before, and mm -hmm. uh, turn it into something typographic. So you're gonna abstract it completely and make it interesting. And then like, it's your little secret that it's about wiener dogs because nobody else knows. And like, just make it that it's a, it's a game and it's a personal project for them. And then I guess the students who feel more defensive about critique, um, I just try to, I guess, and I hope I, you know, it'd be great to hear from my own students on this, but I try to like uh, kind of explode when, when there's explode sounds a terrible word, but when there is um, like a conversation happening in a critique and somebody feels like they're getting shot down, even if they're not like I kind of try and say, OK, let's step, step back and dissect the comments, like which pieces of this are useful to you, which pieces are making you feel 
like you've done something wrong and like we have a conversation as a group and um, so that everybody understands that the way that they're saying things could be changed and also the way that they're interpreting things might need to be looked at again so right it is like and the reason why i say it's the forever question of the lifetime time question is that all designers have such a hard time not taking the work personally we're yeah. so used to drawing when we're children and putting it on the fridge and getting the yeah you did such a great job whether you know so when you don't get the the a-ok -okay from mom and dad it's like oh my gosh and you know maybe i did something wrong um so that is something that everyone has to learn it's very difficult really so, hard yeah it's yeah. really hard yeah thank you jess for asking yeah. that question <laughs> Excellent. Great. So I have one more question, then we'll uh, end it. Uh, um, do you, you do have a grad program, right? We do. Yeah. In Kent. Yes. So yeah. what is the main difference between their learnings? Like, what do you teach the grad students that's different than the undergrad? So the grad program is actually quite different from our undergrad. Um, I've only been getting slowly more involved in it because I'm junior faculty. So I only got my graduate faculty status last year. Um, so my very first thesis supervisee is um, Natalie, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but the focus in the grad program is much more on research. Um, and often the outcomes are more of a written research project than they are a practical. Uh, not that it's not practical, but they're not a, a designed outcome necessarily. Um, but we have them, um, they have critical making classes, so using graphic design or design just as a process, as a way of answering questions or exploring ideas, um, as much as making things. Uh, they have a design theory class, which the undergrads just have that information kind of threaded through their lessons in assignments. Um, they have usually got an applied project in their first year, um, which takes like a, a problem of society. So it might not be an actual um, graphic design project, but they have to research it and kind of distill it. And so it's really looking at design process and, and design research as a thing in itself. So there's mm -hmm. quite a bit of difference, yeah. So you, you prescribe the learning outcomes for the undergrad classes where you don't so much for the grad classes. Yeah, that, I think that's fair to say, yeah. yeah. Got it. So. The, un the learning outcomes for your undergrad classes in terms of type design, just because I don't teach type design and I don't know it as well as you, obviously. <laughs> um, so what are the, what are you asking your students to get out of the type design classes? For them to understand the, the system of a full alphabet, for them to create a font, to sell it, to like, what is, what are they, what are they, what are the goals of the class? So the goals of the class and, and the outcomes are slightly different. Obviously, sometimes people will get more out of it than less or mm -hmm. vice versa. My goals for the students are for them to think about shape as personality, typography as personality and a kind of expression of atmosphere and mood and meaning. Um, to understand a little bit more about how typographic systems are created. So we only make one weight and we only make the A through Z and the numbers. But looking at, uh, in order to do that, they have to decide what weight they're going to start with and why they need to think about that and how a typographic system functions. So like how the bold relates to the light, how the italics supports the regular, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, the idea of typographic and graphic systems as being completely interrelated um, so that they can make something from nothing basically as a designer. Great. Well, it's amazing to see the type design is so well integrated and it definitely seems to, from the images that you show, that it does inform the work of the students. Um, and what amazing facility you have, by the way, I'm totally jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're excited. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. So thank you so much, Aoife. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to uh, have another um, speaker in about a month or so. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions, Aoife can be, uh, what's the best way to reach you? I know that you uh, had in your slide, but. Yeah, um, so on Twitter, I'm just my name. Uh, so at Aoife Mooney. Mm -hmm. And my email address here is amooney2 at kent.edu. And that's probably the easiest to get me. And when do you start your semester? Next Thursday. Ah, okay. Yeah. So almost. <laughs> well, I know. Have fun preparing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> thank you All so right. much for having me and thanks for everybody for the great questions. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good day, guys. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.